Hello and a warm welcome to everyone. We would like to wish everyone a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Samantha from Safeopedia, and here at Safeopedia, our mission is to support the EHS professionals, operational folks, and any safety-minded individuals with free safety information, tools, and education. Just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded, and we will send out a link to the recording to everyone in a few days. The webinar is for you, the okay. audience, so let's keep it interactive. Make sure you get your questions and your comments into the GoToWebinar console, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Today, we're proud to present Achieving a Safe Workplace in a COVID Environment, Ventilation Remediation to Abate Airborne COVID Transmissions. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you today's presenters, Larry Gold and Gabor Lantos. Larry is a non-practicing member of the Ontario Law Bar, a business asset appraiser, an Ontario government appointed bailiff, a bankruptcy liquidator, a trained legal and financial collaborative practitioner, and a seasoned legislative and industry practice reformer and advocate. He has a knack for initiating and facilitating many high profile industry projects, necessarily bringing multiple interested private and public stakeholders to the table. At the outset of the pandemic, he assembled a brain trust of global multidisciplinary experts and industry stakeholders as a collaborative strategic partnership. Under the umbrella of the BK2B pilot research project, BK2B has developed technology-based best practices protocols necessary to detect and correct the primary facilitators of COVID transfer. These protocols pave the way for businesses to reopen and safely and sustainably coexist with the COVID and the developing variants. Dr. Gabor Lantos is one of the primary members of the BK2B Brain Trust. He has been involved with the health and safety. He has been involved with health and safety for the past 45 years as a professional engineer, a manager, and for the past 33 years as an occupational health physician. He has consulted to numerous hospitals, public institutions, universities, and corporations with varied sectors. He was closely involved with the SARS 2003 prevention, nosocomial infectious and made both oral and written submissions to the SARS Commission. He was co-developer of the NIOSH approved one size fits all N95 respirator. Currently with the COVID-19, he is keeping employees safe in essential workplaces. He has been a strong advocate for the both effective ventilation and air handling systems against respiratory pathogens and for optimal PPE. I am very grateful to have you all sit back, relax and enjoy the presentation. With that, Larry and Gabor, please take it away. Good morning, Gabor. Good morning, Samantha. And good morning, all of you out there. On behalf of myself and Gabor, I welcome all of you to this very important training webinar, which focuses primarily on the issue of safe air in our workplaces. I'm going to give you a little bit more detailed background of this BK2B project, which Samantha references. Reference. Uh, BK2B stands for Back to Business, and effectively what it is, is a research pilot project that was initially originated or created for the purpose of the restaurant and the hospitality industry. Because I have a lot of involvement in that industry, as soon as the COVID hit, I knew that we had a serious problem or that industry had a serious problem as it relates to the issue of how are we going to avoid shutdowns by stemming what was considered to be the primary, the primary route or methodology by which airborne pathogens spread from person A to person B. The, uh, the BK2B protocols have been specifically designed to be both, both scalable and easily adaptable for other congregate workplace settings. And the word congregate simply means where we have a number of people who are congregating in the same area and, um, as I keep saying colloquially, sharing the same air. Uh, these uh, principles, which uh, Gabor and I are going to be enunciating today, apply to many, many different industries, although we're talking today about um, the pharmaceutical industry, it applies to all congregate workplaces uh, with some, again, scalability, adaptability, including warehousing, factories, food processing, 
Uh, and most recently, we've turned a lot of attention to the issue of uh, schools because of the, um, the important issue as to um, how do we appropriately remediate what Gabor and other professionals in his um, area speak of as IAQ, which is interior air quality. Um, I am pleased to highlight the fact that the BK2B pilot research project has the written support of Dr. Pascal Michel, who is the chief science officer of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, BK2B, in order to coexist, um, has brought together, as Samantha mentioned, a variable brain trust, which we call um, our own science table, which includes a number of highly credentialed individuals, including epidemiologists, infectious disease specialists, former employees of the Public Health Agency of Canada, who between them have over 100 years of boots on the ground, um, uh, actual um, uh, experience in the areas relating to outbreak, pandemic response, uh, we haven't had a pandemic before, but we've had many, many different outbreaks. Um, we also have, as part of our collaborative team, um, industrial hygienists, and uh, Gabor will explain to you what those people are, HVAC engineers, who are the people who know how to move air around, HVAC contractors, the guys who do the actual um, work in the facility in order to adjust and uh, install and remediate the HVAC sy system. Uh, we have also surrounded ourselves with a number of what I call vetted service and technology providers, which include the people who manufacture what you'll hear about today, the HEPA filter systems. We have people who manufacture what's called ATP luninometers, which are the little bits of scientific equipment that measure um, surface bacteria levels. Um, we have um, people who are manufacturers or distributors of um, phone scan contact tracing uh, devices or technology. And uh, we've recently added to our little consortium of individuals a manufacturer developer of what I'll refer to as building metrics monitoring equipment. Um, I won't get into describing all of that, but you name it, we've got it. Um, as I indicated, what we're gonna talk about today applies to your workplace and um, it applies to other workplaces. Um, I, I am so pleased to have Gabor with me today because Gabor has been what I refer to as um, my right hand in terms of bringing to the table the metrics necessary to understand the issue of aerosol spread. Uh, Gabor was kind enough to explain to me early in our contact the fact that the HVAC engineering people are the people who know how to move air. The doctors at the other end of the spectrum are the individuals that know once that little creepy pathogen gets into your system, how do they treat the result of the pathogen being uh, getting in it being in your system? And people like Gabor and people like industrial hygienists are the people who understand how the pathogen moves within the interior air envelope. Um, the construct of what BK2B has put together again, under the mentorship and leadership of people like Gabor and other experts in the area of the movement of the pathogen in the air, has been closely designed to follow what Gabor will talk about in some detail. Uh, I see Gabor smiling a little bit, the precautionary principle. And um, I, I won't take away from Gabor's thunder in order to explain what that is. Um, as um, we indicated, Gabor is, from my perspective, an extremely well-credentialed individual to talk about this particular topic, particularly because he had so much involvement back in 2003, which is more than a decade ago, dealing with the issue of the airborne aerosol spread 
of the pathogens under the rubric then of what we call SARS-1. Uh, effectively, you all should know, or Gabor will explain, um, our current pandemic is effectively another SARS-1. And originally, uh, it was called, from what I recall, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so we're just another, we're just experiencing another family of the the uh, the SARS um, family, well, the family of the family. So let's uh, let's get the uh, let's get things going here now. So I, I spoke to you about BK2B, and now we're going to go into a little slide. And uh, Gabor, you're there. Here. Okay. So uh, this slide, um, Gabor, why don't you just take us into us? This sure. is a slide. We're from Toronto. I don't know where all you people are listening from, but this is a particular slide which sets out areas within the greater Toronto area in which we've seen the largest instances of COVID um, uh, infections. And you can see particularly the areas in red, which are the high concentration areas. So let me just leave it at that and turn it over to my colleague, uh, Gabor Lantos. Go ahead, Gabor. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I just thought this slide of Toronto, and this is a map of Toronto of about close to 3 million people. It shows the distribution of the cases throughout Toronto. The green, what is mostly green in the middle, vertically, the bottom is a lake and going vertically up is a very high density, primarily office and residential area. These are the people who manage to quote unquote work from home, relatively affluent middle class and up, who can manage to self isolate in their bunkers, not move around much, buy everything on internet, ordering food, et cetera. These are not the people who have high contact with the outside world, but it is high density. This is the bottom green and the dead center orange. That is downtown Toronto. You've seen pictures of Toronto. You know what it looks like, the skyline is high density, but people who are pretty much self-isolated, not coming in contact and working from home. As we move out from the center, to both sides, you will see that it gets progressively yellow, orange, and red. So progressively higher incidences. The red, I'll skip over the orange and red, you can imagine. The red is where we have primarily warehouses, manufacturing sectors, blue collar workers, frontline workers, people who are not able to self isolate, such as the ones in the green belt that I discussed before. These are the people that are coming in contact primarily in their workplaces. Then, of course, they take it home and it, it further spread. There's a lot of spread in the house, the people's homes, as you well know. So the point here is that this diagram shows, or this map shows, that a lot of the cases come from high contact workplace areas. Next slide. No, this I'm is not the sure. Jubilee not... Princess, if I got the name right. This is the boat that was one of the first ships, cruise ships that was grounded, isolated, everybody confined to their quarters, and yet there was a lot of spread. The reference is down on the bottom. It was on CBS, CBC National News. Dr. Fishman, uh, Dr. Uh, Fisher, I'm going to click up. We'll click on it. He'll start speaking. He's one of the many infectious disease doctors, like many other, that held to this concept of surface contact, droplet contact, six feet rule. He was the same, but after the cruise ship isolations and the spread on the cruise ships, he became a convert and re and started realizing. That the only way these people got infected was through the ventilation system. We're going to have to stick with this. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll go over some historical perspectives and some recent realizations from different authoritative societies. So this is Canadian architect. I guess the Canadian is not showing. Uh, fairly recent. It's uh, February 2nd, 2021. Architectural engineering interventions, and I emphasize, reduce the transmission of COVID through the improved ventilation, filtration, and airflow. That is what I will be trying to emphasize over the next number of slides. Next slide. This is from the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, OSPI. Again, there's the headline, engineers call on Ontario to refocus efforts on the airborne transmission. Against this virus that has not been properly addressed by the Ontario government hitherto, the need for proper ventilation and air filtration to stop the spread. Next slide. Okay. Now, just this uh, concept of airborne spread is not new. The authorities are finally beginning to acknowledge it, but this is not new. We've known it during SARS-1. I got involved earlier than that with tuberculosis. And this hospital ward picture, the reason I'm showing this, this whole concept started in the 19th century with Florence Nightingale. Even if you don't know much about her, you know she that was 150 years ago. She developed a design called the hub and spokes design of hospitals. The hub was the central administrative center. The spokes were such that they were narrow enough that you had windows on both sides, as you can see from that picture when we get it back on. So the patients were there, but the windows on both sides of this spoke corridor of the hospital allowed for cross ventilation. Those windows were wide open. Any virus was diluted. They, of course, didn't have HVAC systems, but at least they got the ventilation, which significantly reduced the concentrations of any pathogens in the air. That's the dilution aspect of ventilation. And this was way back. Literally 100, and I mean, the picture's not 150 years old. It's a little more recent than that. I think it's around the 1920s, but the concept was the same. Next slide. The six foot rule you hear every, everywhere. Well, the six foot rule came from those corridors. This is just one picture from the 1920s where you had people slide by slide. It happens to be in the military. It says here, Relation of distance between edges of beds to carrier states and plaques and barrack rooms, it's military. But the point was that, and you can see the percentages, the further the beds were from each other, and then of course, as you saw in the previous pictures with curtains in between, the lower rate of infection. So when each bed was three feet from that curtain, the carrier rate friend fell to 2%. This is this magic in the 21st century. This is the foundation of the six foot rule, going back a hundred years. It didn't say it stops it. It doesn't say it contaminated, but and this by the way was for tuberculosis. The infection rate within that corridor, when the windows open, was significantly down from 30% when they very close down to 2% when they were six feet apart. It's an epidemic, it's an um, epidemiological um, observation and empiric observation that worked, but not very scientific and certainly doesn't stand up to 21st century. Next up slide. These are just current journals, uh, authoritative sources about airborne spread. This is the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Uh, CMAJ, CITUS CMAJ uh, in uh, June of 8th. Ventilation is a key mitigation measure against airborne transmission and recommendations and funding should be provided to businesses and schools for the assessment and upgrades. Addressing airborne transmission requires the expertise of interdisciplinary teams. And I emphasize that I am a physician. 
but doctors do not have the solution when it comes to transmission and spread. As a general rule, the doctors were experts at treating it when it's in the body. We are not the experts in how it gets into the body. So addressing airborne transmission requires the expertise of interdisciplinary teams. There are many of those. Uh, one, one of the main ones are people, you can see citations from aerodynamics, bioparticles, uh, particle physics. It's what is the, what are the pathogens? If it is a virus, what are the pathogens in the air and how do they get from point A to point B? And how do we stop them from getting from point A to point B? So interdisciplinary key is key. Next slide. That was the Canadian Medical Association Journal. You'll see, you'll get copies of the slides. You can read these yourselves. Up top right corner, you see BMJ. That's British Medical Journal, which is one of the most authoritative medical journals in the world. Improving indoor air and quality will help us to stay safe. Um, if the virus is, uh, sorry, it is now clear that SARS-CoV-2, notice the SARS version there, the COVID came a little later and that's for political reasons, we, they didn't want to scare people with the word SARS. It is now clear that SARS-CoV-2 transmits mostly between people at close range through inhalation. Well, inhalation means it's in the air and before you can inhale it, it's got to stay in the air. Next slide. This is the Lancet, which is the other founding medical journal out of Britain. And, and of course, it, uh, now these journals are global. 10, not one, not two, not three, 10 scientific reasons in support of airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. Yeah, this is Public just... Health Ontario, finally acknowledging as much heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system in buildings and COV2. Uh, put online, you can, this is online by the way, you can get it online. Just go to Public Health Ontario and go into the search, March 2021. Next slide. This is the Public Health Association of Canada reports outbreaks in settings with poor ventilation. Drawing as much fresh air as possible so it gets into the ventilation aspects of it and above it, the air condition. So this is from public health. This is way back, originally November, updated in March of 2021. The, the reference is on the bottom. Next page. This is about a 20-page document. This is a Monona Rousseau is one of the foremost ventilation experts in the world. She's internationally recognized. She's got a, literally 50 years experience in the field. Uh, if anybody's interested, we can later refer you to a webinar she's done multiple times, most recently two days ago on this whole topic and we'll get into a lot more technical details than I will as she spends two to two and a half hours on the subject, but it is incredibly thorough. So as she says, inhalation of very fine respiratory droplets and aerosol particles. And that essentially is how to mitigate that, how to abate that technically. And that is the focus of her two, two and a half hour webinar. Next slide. CDC is now a major factor, uh, acknowledges that uh, ventilation and air handling is required to mitigate the virus transmission. Uh, this was, I sorry, I don't, this is an extract from a larger slide, so I lost the uh, citation for it, but this was roughly uh, May of this year. Larry, you wanted to make some comments here? Oh, next, on the next slide. Oh, so there's the reference, sorry, that was a previous one. And uh, um, the go-to expert, the guru of COVID, uh, Dr. Fauci, clearly one of the most important things 
is proper ventilation. Of course, he's a physician, he's talking in generic terms, ventilation meaning movement of air. I have to expand on that, it's ventilation, HVAC systems, and filtration. But he has acknowledged as much back around May the 10th. Next paper, or did you wanna say something like that? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to generically comment. Uh, you've been going rather quickly through some of this. The whole concept of aerosol spread began in, as, uh, as Gabor mentioned, the CDC chimed into it and uh, the WHO chimed into it. And the entire U.S. was a fire in terms of the whole issue of um, the, the, uh, the spread being an aerosol spread. Um, in, in, uh, in Canada, and I don't know how many of you in Canada, it wasn't until, um, Gabor mentioned, it wasn't until May of that year of 2020, uh, actually November 2020, with the Canadian government finally came out and said, yep, you're right, this thing is aerosol spread. So we have a particular problem in Canada, and to the degree you have it in the U.S., there still continues to be a pushback as to whether the virus is airborne aerosol spread, and Gabor will get into that. But the second part of that issue is, well, if it's airborne spread, then we should be doing something about the ventilation. And going back, and I'm just kind of cleaning up a little, in terms of the slide that you saw on the, uh, on the uh, Diamond Jubilee Princess, that was an indicator of the fact that these people weren't getting sick by sneezing on one another. These people were getting sick or becoming infected as a result of the COVID pathogen coming through the, uh, the uh, ventilation system. Even earlier than that, one of the earliest reported cases was out of a Chinese restaurant in Wuhan, China, in which they had documented thousands and thousands of frames of people sitting in the, in the restaurant. And lo and behold, this was a birthday party, but people at the other end of the room that didn't talk, sneeze, hug, or share uh, directly, they were not within the six foot range, they were also infected. And the instances of this kept growing and growing. We have a number of high profile uh, choir practices in which people at choirs in Washington state were, were busy doing nothing but singing and 75% of them became infected, notwithstanding the fact that they did not hug, they were not within six feet of one another, they didn't share drink, they didn't share food. So we're gonna start concentrating now heavily on the issue of dealing with and blocking the primary route of spread, which is the airborne aerosol spread. Next slide. I mentioned Manona Rousseau, uh, the, the expert, who's internationally around, who, by the way, is on the advisory board of the American Council of Government Industrial Hygienists. She single-handedly has managed to keep the movie industry going because they have adopted her standards, which I will show you later, which now is her standards and others, but she's a, a dominant advocate and proponent, and we'll show you some of those numbers later, uh, has kept the movie industry functioning throughout the pandemic because any facility they go to has to meet its very specific minimum air handling, I'll use the generic term, air handling standards. I'll get into the specifics later. Um, that's Monona there receiving an award. But the other aspect of it was that this whole ventilation system broke up into three groups back in the 80s. Some of you, if you're familiar with air conditioning, you're all probably familiar with ASHRAE. These are in commercial buildings. These are the people you have heard of the ASHRAE standards. They're, they have standards, but it's primarily for keeping people comfortable in, in institutions and buildings where the parameters are primarily temperature, relative humidity, and carbon dioxide buildup. 
The second focus that they have to conserve energy because these buildings have to be heated. So it's creating comfort zones within the buildings. These are ASHRAE is not what's used in industry, pharmaceutical, or chemical. That is industrial hygiene and industrial ventilation, which falls under the aegis of AIHA, Association of Industrial Hygienists of America, and what I mentioned earlier, the American Council of Government Industrial Hygienists. These are the people who designed the standards for, in the, for industrial ventilation to abate harmful products, chemicals, drugs, so that people are safe. Detoxify the air, if you wish. Next slide. And just to give a little bit co more context in terms of where exactly Gabor is going to now, um, you've all heard earlier in the pandemic about all of the concern with washing your groceries and keeping six feet apart and putting up plexiglass screens, et cetera, et cetera. We're now going to be moving into another area. We're going to go beyond the six feet and start talking about how these little particulates, these little aerosols escape from one's mouth everyone's mouth when you're breathing, when you're singing, when you're talking, when you're screaming, and how they become little minuscule particulates that float in the air and therefore become problematic entities well beyond that six foot spacing, which Gabor previously referred to in his earlier slides. This is a simple graphic representation of how long it takes for something to settle in still air. I mean, you've heard of Galileo, but the feather and the, and, and the lead ball fall at the same rate only in vacuums. In still air, which virtually doesn't exist except in artificially created laboratory settings, there's always movement. The minute you walk into a room, there's turbulence. But in, in still air, you can go from left to right, 0.1 microns, 300 hours. That's virus particle size. Different viruses, different particles. Uh, specific to the COVID particle, it's somewhere in the range of, on average, um, 0 0.12, 0 0.13 microns. So it's, it's between the two left lines. So you go from 300 hours to 100 micrometers, which can take 3.1 seconds. These are the droplets that you've heard about so much. This is the six foot rule, the, the droplets. Yes, in still air, you might drop in three, one second and you may not breathe it in. In turbulent air, it can take much longer. You all know that feathers can stay afloat for indefinitely. Seeds are designed to be airborne and can travel miles before they settle into fertile ground. So there are different times for different sizes. The droplet rule is the cutoff there, and that's why I use 100 microns here. The cutoff of what they consider to be droplets is 100 microns. That takes three point in still air. Turbulent air, it can take much longer. Next slide. There are some very good graphics. And they were actually studied with tracer gases. The graphics won't show that, but of who will get infected in a given room under various circumstances is excellently done by El Pais in Spain. And as you know, Spain was very badly hit, especially early on. So they've done some excellent work. The reference is there for people who want to see more than just some of the pictures that I'll show up with my basic explanations. Next slide. And um, I would just add that I think we're now getting into a very important part of this presentation as my note indicates on the bottom. I and Gabor have always been a firm believer in the fact that a picture is worth a thousand words. Now we're gonna see some actual illustrations that are excellent illustrations
as to how exactly the aerosols that we breathe out, um, how it functions within the air, and how when we have different numbers of people within a closed air envelope environment, how does the risk of transmission increase based upon certain factors relating to, and Gabor mentioned one of them, the fact that we're not in still air, which means that whatever you breathe out is going different places in the room, even from you walking into the room, and how our risk increases based upon certain metrics relating to how that air is being controlled, moved, et cetera, et cetera. And here you go, Gabor, here's your first graphic. So here's, here's your typical room. Uh, the fact that, you know, this is a living room or the next one will be a bar, it doesn't matter. It's a room with X number of people in it. There's a closed window and a closed door. Air is not moving anywhere except people move around and create some turbulence and the pathogens move around. I purposely will use the word pathogens of Apart from aside from COVID, because I want to emphasize that what we're going to talk about is not COVID specific. It will be whatever we implement will be here when COVID is quote unquote under control. We have flu every year. This applies to flu. This applies to the person who hasn't been vaccinated for measles or chickenpox. Or any one of the other issues, any one of the other pathogens, or MERS that comes along, or bird flu, whatever comes along, this system, proper system, will be able to manage all of those, not just COVID. So here's a room with six people in it. The red person is the one who's the spreader, and the other people are the occupants. As Spanish data said, 31% of the outbreaks recorded in Spain were caused by just this kind of gathering. And I'm sure you probably, each one of you, have some anecdotal evidence of something similar. Next slide. So this is a statement of the fact that 31% of the spread of the virus in a community is community spread, not in the workplace, 31% of it is even in your own home as a result of ventilation within your home. Now we're going to increase the number of people in that room. And getting back to the original map that I showed you, those red areas, those are where people work. And for the most part, it's also where they live. So they, if they pick it up at work from one of their family contacts, they take it to work and spread it there. And vice versa. The red areas are, let's call them the blue collar workers, the frontline workers, your cashiers, your factory workers, your warehouse workers. These are the people who cannot hunker down in their bunkers. So they either take it from work to home or from home to work. And that's why those are the red areas. Now, this is the very same room four hours later, and basically everybody's infected. Whether they're wearing masks, whether they were six feet apart, it's a fixed, closed room with little to no quote unquote ventilation. Pathogens will, each one of them exhales, or the affected person will exhale it, and the other people will breathe it in. Next slide. And you're going to hear us talk about this again because the effective creation of little boxes, even in your workplace setting, Let's just say this is a cubicle in which all these five people were sharing air with this guy who, uh, who is infected with the, uh, with the virus. They're all going to pick it up. So keep all of this in the back of your mind because Gabor is going to come again to it when we start talking about what I refer to as plexiglass mania in the workplace. The, 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 the spreader is exhaling it and someone wears a mask, or even if he wears a mask, as you know, there's a lot of escape. The aerosols will be in the air, they'll spread. And of course, this is four hours, so I have to emphasize that the risk of exposure is also time-dependent. The longer someone's in that environment, 
greater than the system. Besides all the technical things we'll uh, be mentioning, of course, consider the fact exposure is time dependent. Next slide. So if you've got face masks, so for sake of argument, four hours later, one person will not get it, the green person, because the pathogen is in the air. These so-called cloth masks are not fitted N95 or N100 respirators. The aerosols get in all through the sides. For the simplest explanation of total inward leakage, you've been wearing masks like this. For those of you who wear glasses, you know your glasses fog up. That's where the air escapes that you breathe, where the infected person is breathing it out. And that is also the exact same place where the infected air in the room gets in. By no means does all the air get filtered through the mask, even if the filter is efficient. I'll have some slides on that later. Next slide. Uh, uh, Gabor, can you see me in the camera picture? Yeah. So here I am wearing one of the N95 types of masks. It's very tightly filled, fitted, but to tell you the truth, I can't breathe through this thing. And this, opposed to a cloth, uh, a, uh, cloth mask, this at least has a higher density and the electrostatic components, which will block most of the, uh, most of the particulates in the air um, getting to me. So here we introduce some ventilation. And it, the emphasis here is not just the air coming in. You've heard a lot of simplistic statements about, well, open windows. Well, I think a lot of you have technical or physical or scientific backgrounds. If you open a window, but you don't open the door, or there isn't an exhaust or another window somewhere, there's not much air that's going to come in can displace it, okay? I mean, there's physical laws. Uh, you have to have an exit point as well. If you remember the slide I showed you about the hospital, it's cross ventilation. You open a window on one side, goes out the other side. And that's, that's what you need. You need a point of entry of the fresh air and a point of exit of the fresh air. And in this situation, you have maybe one person who's closest to the infected person who is getting infected. Of course, this is all schematic. I'm not going to quantify this. But if you go into the actual El Pais papers, you'll get quantification. Next slide. And, and I would point out as well that um, you're seeing this little figure of the person's nose and what they're breathing out. This is the kind of stuff that uh, has been worrisome to people in terms of the six foot uh, safe zone, I call it. So this person is just breathing, but had they been uh, sneezing, coughing or yelling, this heavy stuff would be going everywhere. What we're gonna be concentrating on now are these little tiny droplet guys that are coming out of his mouth and then dehydrating and then floating in the air all over the place such that doesn't matter if you're one foot from them or sitting at the other end of the room, depending upon the air currents in the room, depending upon the time that you've spent there, depending upon how much fresh air is coming in, depending upon the air exchange rate in the room, that will determine whether or not these little tiny guys get into your system, not whether or not you are sprayed by this individual's sneeze. Next slide. All right, so here's a diagram of a person sneezing. You're going to get particles of various sizes. I'll have other illustrations as well. You'll have the big particles, which is full of, which is the virus, coated with saliva, mucus from the nose, materials from the lung, depends from where it's coming. You have large droplets and, and small droplets. You'll have a perfusion, of course, closer to 
the spreader. Large droplets will fall fairly quickly, though some of them will evaporate, become the droplet size are not constant. Large droplets become small droplets. I'll explain that shortly. And the smaller particles that we talked about will stay airborne for various lengths of time, depending on ambient conditions, temperature, humidity, uh, turbulence. Next slide. Again, this is experiment in still air, but the schematic still applies. The idea is you have a silent breather sitting quietly in a room and the orange particles are the ones that end up being airborne. Talking, much more particles spread, shouting for an hour, obviously you're going to have more in an hour than you have in two minutes. So the time dependence is there and the, exert, the, the, the physical exertion of the person spreading it what they are doing. Of course, if they're exercising, it would be higher rate of breathing, bigger tidal volumes, bigger exhalations. So a number of factors go into it. So it's the expiration at what rate and how much and the time element. Next slide. <clears throat> and th this is again in still air. With time, you can see the orange again being pathogen particles just spreading, but they don't stay localized. They increase in numbers, but they increase in dispersion. And by 60 minutes, even though, again, if you want six feet, if you're closer to the person, you have a higher concentration. But even at the edges of the room, you have plenty of pathogens there too. Next slide. Uh, this. I showed you the, 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 the slide there about particles falling, what takes how long to fall. This is that 10 micron, the PM, for those of you who are into this kind of business, the so-called PM, uh, part of, uh, particle size range, your red blood cells. Tuberculosis is here and the COVID is there. And you can see that it's easily three, four, five times the size of the these things will stay airborne for quite a long time. Next slide. Now the COVID particle, even though it's tiny, it, I, and I'll state this as a fact, it's not my fact, it's an acknowledged fact, that the virus particle is never isolated. It always attaches to something. It is so small that van der Waal forces electrostatics, they always attach to something. They don't exist in isolation. That's why you get the various, that's why you get various particle sizes and that's why that is important. They're not all 0.125 or 0.1 micrometers. So here you have two viral particles in a, let's call it a saliva droplet. The interesting part though is whatever size that droplet is, and you'll see there are different sizes here, they don't stay that size. Like most of the world, you know, it's, it's mostly water. Those droplets, whatever they are, will start desiccating. And again, depending on ambient conditions, primarily temperature, relative humidity, and, and, and air turbulence, they will desiccate. And the more they desiccate, the smaller the droplet that's left, and the easier it is for it to remain airborne. So even if for those who believe in the droplet concept, they don't remain droplets. They desiccate and they became smaller and smaller. So at the release point, you have different sizes. And after release, the bigger droplets will desiccate and became smaller droplets, facilitating airborne spread. Next slide. So just to add a little bit of context to this, um, I'm sure you've all had the experience of sneezing in your car and some of these guys end up on your window or they end up floating in the car. Uh, what Gorbor has indicated is that these little, uh, these little bad guys 
do not ride alone. They're carried around by something. And to the extent that this is the goober, or let's call it that, that comes out of your mouth, this outer envelope, which protects the pathogen, will eventually dehydrate. And then it will become these small particulates or particles or aerosols that float around in the air. And then we're back into what we described earlier. The longer you're in that room, the less remediation that's done in that room to make sure that there's fresh air coming in to dilute the number of these guys floating around, the less attention being paid to what we're going to hear about soon, which is the air exchange rate, how often the air in this room is uh, exchanged. We're going to hear about how we can use uh, portable filters in order to filter out these guys. Um, this is the problem in that all of these guys, once they dehydrate, and uh, the uh, the word which uh, Gabor used to describe what happens as they as they get smaller and smaller, uh, this is a process that's followed. That's why we're not safe enough simply worrying about staying six feet away from someone and having that plexiglass screen in front of us. We got to worry about the total air envelope that we're being subject to particularly if we have a typhoid Harry in the room, particularly if we're planning to spend four hours there. Well, just to expand on that, you, you've all heard the word super spreaders. That's exactly what they are. And they have high for whatever reason, typically because they're sicker, but not necessarily. Uh, there's a concept in epidemiology called heterogeneity, susceptibility. Some people are more susceptible, they carry more viruses, exhale more viruses. So the super spreaders, they're, they're especially the ones that cause a lot of the outbreaks and they're the ones that we really want to protect ourselves. And the more people you're surrounded with in any given setting, the more likely that one of them is going to be a super spreader. But of course, you can also have three people who aren't super spreaders, they're just infected, will spread just as many. So this is a bit of physics. So I won't get into too many details, but it's basically how the filters work, whether they're quote unquote masks, respirators, or the filters in the ventilation system we'll talk about later, the HEPA filters and the other levels of filtration. You've got particle size along the bottom going left to right, and you got Efficiency of the filter. Now, the bigger particles, they just get stuck. Initial impaction. And the, the yellow are, is, is the filter material, if you will, and the black is the pathogen. So a big particle just hits the filter, the filament, whatever, and it's trapped. So that's the big ones. And you've got some of the smaller ones that kind of go around, but eventually you've got more than one filament in those filters. They will eventually get trapped, maybe not at the first encounter or the second or the third. And of course, by the law of probabilities, some small fraction will manage to navigate through all of them. So on the right side, the curve, you see that the smaller that particle, the efficiency starts dropping down. <laughs> get down to the smallest particles, they get attracted. They don't get trapped physically. They're too small. They'll, they they find their way through. But there's an electrostatic attraction. Now, I have to emphasize that cloth masks, most masks, especially all these off-the-shelf masks, are not electrostatically charged. When you buy approved so-called surgical masks and then of course proper respirators those are carry they're manufactured to carry electrostatic charges and that is specifically so that the small particles that would find their way through the maze of the filter fiber in the filtration system get attracted and trapped electrostatically the simplest analogy I can give you, you've all had birthday parties either as a kid yourself or for your own children, air up, 
the balloon in your hair and it sticks to the wall. That's how the electrostatic charge in a filtration system, be it a mask or be it in the vacuum, the uh, HVAC system works. Commercial off the shelf masks, so called masks, these cloth masks that people are wearing are not electrostatically charged. And the most damaging sized particle, which is in that middle range of this graph, is a point three microns. All, fil all filters for these reasons are least effective in that band, in that width range. And from the previous diagrams I've shown, that is exactly the particle size range of what we are trying to mitigate or filter or treat by other means. So if you're going to wear a mask at all, get a proper uh, uh, surgical mask that has been electrostatically charged. Next slide. Uh, Gabor, I have the producer whispering in my ear. You're going to have to pick up the pace considerably yep. as you move through oh. the uh, okay, slides. So I'll just carry on and I think I've made my emphatic point, so I think I can speed up, up here. So how long will they last? This is what one study shows after, C in the, and this is from the CBC website, and Google CBC, Tulane, whatever. They found not just particles, but particles that were infected. Those with a microbiological bent, they put it on an agar plate, just like they do in hospital labs, and they're still multiplying. So even particles after 16 hours in the air are still infected. Now, I'm not saying they're all good for 16 hours. This is one study, but it's not two seconds to drop to the floor. Next slide. I'm speeding up. Okay, this is, we'll expand more on air. ACH stands for air changes per hour. How many times you change the air in the room in a given hour through HVAC system means? So the time required to remove the air at ACH2 or to exchange, it takes two hours. If your air exchange is six, which is the minimum, which I'll get to, two, it takes about 46 minutes to remove 99% of the air. That is to exchange it, to take the old air, the stale air, and bring in fresh air. For 99.9% .9 removal, you need an hour and nine minutes. I emphasize the ACH of six because that is the minimum standard by all some of those authorities I've uh, shown you earlier. That is now considered to be the minimum for HVAC systems. Next slide. This is just an inverted triangle showing uh, efficacies of certain things. The N95 respirators are 90%. Why not 95? Because no matter how good they fit it, they still have leakage around the edges. So that's 90%. Your face coverings, these so-called masks, quote unquote, at best, they're 10%. The loose fitting ones may be 5%. So if somebody is literally sneezing in your face, it's going to trap some of that. Uh, the better fitting ones may take 10%. That is the limit. They're no more effective than and just the biggest particles, they do nothing for the aerosol particles that are coming in through the periphery. And then you get to the air exchanges, and at six air exchanges per hour, we're looking at about 95%. The previous slide will show you how much air, and of course, that's infected air, is exchanged at six air changes per hour. Next slide. Uh, similar to the previous slide, this is a bar. But it could be any office setting. You've got a patient there who's read occupancy today. I think that right now we're up to 50% occupancy in Ontario. And how long is it going to take for different people to get infected? Next slide. Okay, four hours later, without proper ventilation, just about everybody's infected just as they were in that small room before. Now, this is a bigger room, it's true, but this is a bar. So people are shedding, people are, lot, are, are, are yelling, even in the, you know, even if it's, you're not yet, but the noise level escalates, so everybody talks louder, 
10 people move around. So within the, in, in the bar, everybody's infected for four hours. Now, maybe the advice here is don't stay in the bar for four hours. Maybe you shouldn't even be in a bar for four hours. That's another issue. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. All right. Forget the top line about the Harvard study. Not, not, what's not good here, if you've got only one source of an entry of the air, one opening, and say there's a fan or whatever, or window coming in, you are going to have a lot of dead space. I showed the previous exa exam where you need a window, but you also need a door for it to exit. Preferably on opposite sides, I'll get to that. When they're both on the same side, you get some kind of circulation. Anything outside of that ribbon is dead space. If you have both openings on the same side, you have a little less dead space, but you still have lots of dead space. If they're on right angles is to each other, still a lot of dead space. Cross ventilation is the ideal, which is what we had in the hospital settings, a la Florence Nightingale. You get the wind going through and it clears out the air. No dead space. Well, you have dead space in the corners, but nothing like before. So you want entry and exit points to be whether windows, whether they're intake and out and, and in, uh, Outflow from the HVAC system, that's how you want it. Next slide. These are the baffles. Now, this is a smoke study. By smoke, I don't mean cigarette smoke, you know, they, they generate smoke and how it flows. Your aerosols flow over the baffles. There's no question you're sitting on the opposite side of a plexiglass. You're not going to get spindles in your face, but the aerosols will still rise, they will cross the barrier, and they will still stay in that room. So the only thing it's preventing is somebody's directly coughing or spitting in your face. So maybe better than nothing, one might think, but the problem is, the bigger problem is that it further interferes with the ventilations we're talking about. Cross -vent How are you going to cross-ventilate across the plexiglass? So it impedes airflow, ventilation. Next slide. The, 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 this is your air output that you see uh, on your ceilings. And if you have any kind of an HVAC system, next slide. This tells you the criticality of where the air is coming from. This is a real picture. You don't necessarily want your air intake to be on the loading dock, especially if there's a truck there running in winter with the diesel fumes. I'm being extreme here, but this picture is not extreme. This is a real picture. Next slide. The same goes on top. These, these big hoods are your air intake. All the little smoke stacks there, all those little ones there. Those are your exhausts, including the exhaust from the toilets. Next slide. This is ASHRAE. This is their 62 on standard we talked about. But the cognizant authority for workplace contaminants, I'm going right down to the bottom for time's sake, okay, is not the ASHRAE. They themselves admit it's AC, GIH, or AIHA. This slide refers to ACGIH. So ASHRAE is for comfort, not for removing toxins and pathogens from the air. Next slide. And, and this kind of feeds into what we talked about earlier. The uh, HVAC engineers are the people who are telling you pre-pandemic pre how to move the air around. Now with the fact that we have this problem dealing with aerosol, airborne aerosols, ASHRAE themselves backed off and said, ASHRAE 62.1 is no longer sufficient. We now have to look at the mandates that are being created by these folks here who are the industrial hygienists. You gotta do more than simply circulate your air as you used to. You now gotta do other things relating to treating that air, making sure that you got enough fresh air coming in, 
Make sure that you have enough air being exchanged per hourly and make sure that you have an efficient air filtration system in your facility and or having a proper filter with enough density to it. They call the MERV rating in order to pick up these small particulates of air from the air. This is just one diagram to illustrate fans. Many of you will have fans personally in your windows or in, in, at the workplace. Fans are effective, especially but circular fans like this need to be sealed. If you just put it in a window, one of these portable fans, the air just goes round and round. Positive pressure on the output side, negative pressure on the intake side, and the air just makes a quick little loop around in circles, and except for a little turbulence that you can feel on your face a little further away, most of the air doesn't go anywhere. So for these to be effective, they have to be sealed so that the air cannot get around around the fan. You want the air through the fan, not around it. And you don't want a short circuit in the All fans for that purpose. So this is just a graphic representation that I want to kind of stick in your eye. Again, this, again, this is a very important topic. Gibor and I were on a call or a conference last um, yesterday in which we were talking about schools. And I'm sure many of you out there may be uh, parents or, or soon to be parents. Uh, the fact of the matter is that many school boards and public health agencies have given the advice to the schools, just stick a fan in the window or open a window. What Gabor is explaining to us is the fact that just sticking a, a regular fan in the window does nothing because the air will get around it. This one is fitted to the window. Again, as Gabor mentioned earlier, opening one window does no good because what you're doing is bringing in the fresh air from outside and mixing it with the, let's just call it pathogen, potentially pathogen infused air on the inside. You have to have a way for it to be ventilated out and you have to have a way to make sure that the air exchange rate is high enough so that any, any aerosols that are floating in the air are appropriately diluted. And dilution is the reason why, for example, they allow you to sit out in a patio. Because a patio, you have airflow, you have fresh air. And if somebody is a super spreader sitting at the table beside you, don't matter that much because here his aerosols are being whisked away by the outdoor air and or even if there's a couple of barriers, it's being diluted by the fresh air that's getting into that little box that you're sitting in. That's right. Next slide. And I won't get into ultraviolet. Ultraviolet, if anything, is an adjunct. If you want to get into technicalities, that's a separate lecture. Uh, the only UV that might be effective is within the duct, if it's proper, if it's done by experts, if it's signed off by the industrial hygienist, hanging an ultraviolet in a room just doesn't work. I don't have time to get into it. I'm mentioning here the air, uh, an air conditioner. Air conditioner is not ventilation. It's a heat exchanger. There is no air exchange with an air conditioner. It's hot on, it's on the outside, it's cool on the inside, and you've got the coils going back and forth. The air conditioner cools the, roof, the, roof, the air in the room. There's no fresh air being introduced. There's no air exchange with an air conditioner. Next slide. And the best way this has been explained to me by experts is it does as much good to sit in an air conditioned room in terms of air quality control as you sitting inside of your refrigerator. Uh, just one quick slide. There's many others. You can do the research. There's always the question who's going to pay for all this? Well, Air conditioning systems pay for themselves. What are the costs of the lockdowns? But apart from getting to that, there's been prior to any pathogens and lockdowns because of well, stuffy air, elevated carbon dioxide levels, all those things. When you have proper ventilation, you have less sick days. Maybe it's not COVID, but maybe it was flu. 
maybe just a common cold. But as I said before, if I, I don't want to make this COVID specific pathogens. So it's very well documented. There's plenty of literature that a good ventilation system results in less sick days, greater productivity, different ways of measuring these, but it, it works on other pathogens as well. So it makes people more productive because of the carbon dioxide levels. People are less sleepy. You all know you can eat stuffy rooms. You know your productivity goes down. You have trouble keeping your eyes open. So there are cost benefits to ventilation. Next slide. Uh, we mentioned the restaurants. This is just one, one of a multitude of slides. But these were people in restaurants who were much further away than the quote-unquote six feet because of the airflow and the other things we've mentioned. So that those are not golden rules. Well, they're maybe a golden rule, but they're, 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 there's much more than six feet of separation. These, these, these were real-life people in specific restaurants who got infected. In fact, some of them with, with only five to ten minute exposure. Next slide. Okay, we're getting into the three key factors, which I will, which is going to be the bottom line. Air exchanges per hour, filter efficiency, the top of the line being heard of as MEP, HEPA filters, and the percentage of fresh air intake, so-called outside air. For all intents and purposes, outside air is not infected. And uh, we're not talking now about pollution. That's a different story altogether. That, I'm not getting into that. Obviously, you have to filter out the pollution and things. That's not the topic of this discussion. So the three key points are filtration, which is filter efficiency, air exchanges, and outside air. Next slide. Just a, a quick and dirty graphic representation of what the filtration system looks like. You've got the return air, some of it gets exhausted, some of it gets returned. There's a filter, there's a fan, heating or cooling uh, systems, diffusers that bring the air back into the room. You've got outside air coming in. Is mixing in the middle between the outside air and the returning air. Next slide. And this slide indicates that under 62.1 from ASHRAE, they recommend a MERV 8, but we know that, now that a Go ahead. Yeah, that, the MERV 8 was the old standard. It's not effective for pathogens, and with this graph I will show you. What this graph shows, here's COV2 in the middle, which is in that 0 0.3 micron range. And these MERV, the MERV only means uh, minimum efficiency reporting value because these standards are, they've got to stamp it on the filter so you know what you're buying. So the minimum efficiency, uh, if, if you're only using a, an A, for instance, uh, in the critical range, you're filtering out 10%. Now, in non-pathogenic environments, that's fine. As I said, air conditioning is for comfort, not to filter out pathogens. And then that will filter out your 10 micron particles. Look over here, your dust and whatever. But it's not good enough for COVID-2. So the recommendation now is a minimum efficiency value of 16. That sort of gets you up into the 80% range. If you got a HEPA filter, that's above MERV 17. That's where you get your 99% filtration. Okay, next stage. Next uh, slide. I would, I would just point out quickly that many people, and I particularly are talking about some gyms that I've spoken to, have run out and they said, oh, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to yank this MERV 8 out of my online system and I'm going to stick in a MERV 16. Uh-uh, it don't work like that. If you put too high of a MERV rating into your system, and it's not a um, a, a, a unit which is a which is a a less dense MERV uh, upper MERV category filter, 
you're just going to slow down your system. If you slow down your system, you're reducing the number of air exchanges per hour. If you're reducing your number of air exchanges per hour, it's counterproductive because then you're not allowing for the expulsion, the dilution, the removal of the pathogens. Every system is, every room, every facility, every system is different. At the end of the day, it means you need specialized services. You basically have to get an industrial hygienist involved to see exactly what you need. These filters, obviously, the better the filter, the more resistance to airflow, the more higher powered fans that are required to drive the system. I think that's intuitively obvious that the higher efficiency filters, just like a mask, the better the mask, the harder it is to breathe. Same thing. So we're back to our bar. Only with the face masks, maybe you have less people infected, but you still have lots of people infected after <clears throat> a couple of hours. Next slide. Here again, we got the air. We got the air intakes, all those squiggly lines. Those are the air entries and the exit. Now, it may maybe an open door in the back. Probably not. The cache is there. It's not a good idea. But if you have a proper system where the airs are coming in, you probably that same system should have air going out. So after two hours with a proper with a well functioning system you'll have a lot less infected people, hopefully only the ones that are in very close contact. Next slide. Ventilation systems, uh, the two basic types, I, I think I've explained this. The, the comfort system is actually the industrial system, toxic airborne substances, is the ACGIH standards. Next. I think we've said this. Next slide. Right. This is the, the ASHRAE the current standards. And there's one key point I will show, which is next slide. Next slide, sorry. This is the industrial uh, American Industrial Hygiene Association's uh, guidelines of what to, to need the previous slides, the black and white slide. Now, the ASHRAE, if you go into it now, tell you the revised one, the previous slide, your breath is not the recognized hazard. That was not never considered before. Only thing that was considered was the buildup of CO2, which was a comfort, considered more of a comfort level and an indicator you need a little more fresh air coming from. Now, Breath is a recognized hazard, and that requires ACGIH. Breath is pathogen laden. Next slide. Modification, so the new standard is modified to take into account infectious aerosols. Next slide. It wasn't before. This is the new version. Now, there's a very generic. I've mentioned carbon dioxide a couple of times, but not in and of itself. We're not talking about asphyxiation. It's never going to get to those levels. It's a marker. It's a non-specific marker, just like taking your temperature. If the CO2 levels are high, it's like your temperature is high. Doesn't tell you which bug you've got. Tells you there's a problem. Go see a doctor. Figure out what's going on. If your CO2 levels are high, then there's something not working in your ventilation air conditioning system, or not working up to snuff. And that's why we measure. Basically, what we're measuring with these instruments is the difference between the outside air, the carbon dioxide outside, and the air 0.04%, which is 400 parts per million versus the inside. I mean, you can't really get below that without going to extreme limits. The outside here is the outside here. So uh, much higher than 400 inside air, unless you're in, a, in a, you know, burning something, is coming from the occupant's breath. So a high carbon dioxide level in today's world, uh, 
Um, Larry's showing you one carbon type of carbon dioxide measure. The carbon dioxide level in an office building or in any closed room is measuring primarily the exhaled air that people are breathing. And that exhaled air could be pathogen laden. So the CO2 now is an in is a non-specific marker. It is something wrong with the ventilation system. It needs to be improved so that people's breaths are being filtered and exchanged with outside air. Next. Uh, I don't know. Can you actually see the face of this carbon dioxide detector that I'm holding, uh, Gabor? Too small. Okay. Oh, I, can see, I can see it. Yeah, now you can see it. 979 parts per million in the room that I'm sitting right now. Which is higher than it should be. Which By means the standards, it should be. Current standards are 700, and we're trying to get it down to 600 which is telling me that this room that I'm in has either poor air circulation, not enough fresh air coming in, or something's wrong with the system in this particular facility. Well, in, in your residence, it's not tragic. But if you had, for instance, if one of your people in your house was told to self-isolate, you would sure as hell want to get it lower than 970. Okay. It's now gone up to 1,028, and a little warning is going off. Well, you might have been breathing on it. <laughs> it's got to be ambient, not in front of your mouth. Okay, next slide. Uh, apropos, I mean, just as we're talking, I'd say it was a good point. It's not just that word. If you happen to have somebody at home who's self isolating or is infected, you want to get, even in your home, you want to get that carbon dioxide down below the standard 700 or even 600 if you can. Open the windows. I mean, that's not you. Your grandmother told you to open. And then what I'm saying is open two windows, not just one. And these are just different ways of ventilating, as you can see, bringing the air on the bottom, XX on the top. I mentioned the fact you don't want them both on the same side. Next slide. Uh, just a, 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 again, different diagrams of, of where your inlets and outlets are. You have a lot of dead space when they're both on the same side. If you have, if you blow in the air with great force in the red, the red, you'll get dead space in between. If you, if it's only mild air coming in, you get the yellow arrow, and virtually the whole room is dead space. So you need that cross current. You need the in exits and outflows of different. Opposite ends, let's put it this way. Next, next uh, slide. This is the ashtray. I want to go right to this class one, two, three, four about how you make things objectionable, comfortable, inoffensive, mildly offensive. Forget it. 5.18.3.4, class four. This is the ashtray, class four. Air shall not be recirculated. So that basically means it's all outside air or you get into your ACGIH. Next slide. You don't want to be recirculating contaminated air. Getting now to the last one or two slides. Air exchanges per hour. We've got it in English unit, metric units. It's nothing really magical. If it's the volume is in your denominator, the volume of room, but please make sure You'll see, you'll see a lot of articles, a lot of papers talk about the size of the room. And people think it's it's length times width. Well, a lot of rooms have a lot of height. They're not all 7.6 inches high or 8 feet high. So it's volume, not surface area. And same when you talk about people density. It's not just per square foot, it's per cubic foot. So that's the key point there in, for air exchanges is the volume of air that your machine is putting in divided by the volume of the room. It's not magic science. In the ventilation room is a very similar type of equation. It's high school math. Next uh, slide. And this is your takeaway 
photocopy it, do it, take uh, snapshots of it. Your ACH efficiency, we've seen that slide before, how many changes per hour to, to, to remove, nine, or not to remove, to, to exchange 99% of a given room. Efficiency, that's your, you've got the next slide, your MERV, which is your filter efficiencies. Uh, MERV 9 will not remove anything at 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 which is the vast majority of your COVID virus. So most office buildings are MERV-8, MERV, and they're just useless as far as uh, pathogens go. In a one to 3% range, that's the larger quote unquote droplets, they'll remove 35%. The better, the higher your MERV, the greater the filtration efficiency. MERV-17 is already called a HEPA filter. And that's your 99.97% the HEPA is supposed to remove. The other number with the MERV, of course, is the lower the MERV. This is table four, the more outdoor air you need. So one is it's not fil filtering, a MERV 13 only filters 3%. So you want dilution. So you have to bring in outdoor air. So yes. MERV is expensive. The higher the MERV, obviously, it causes more expensive because the filter is more expensive and you need a more powerful driving system, fans uh, to drive the whole system because of the resistance. But you need less outside air that you have to uh, heat in winter or cool in summer. So there's a balancing act purely from a cost benefit point of view. Obviously, uh, the, the more, the higher the MERV and the more outdoor air you're bringing in, the less pathogens that are going to be hanging around. Relative risk reductions, according to AIHA, 17 filters, and it's, this is basically the same as the inverted triangle I showed you before. This is, these are scientific studies. This is not off the top of anybody's head. These are proven, these are calculated. Mentally, the face coverings are between five to ten percent, and once you get into your air exchanges of at least six, you're getting up to ninety-five percent with the appropriate necessary outdoor air makeup. Next slide. Please okay. Please a copy of these slides. This is if now I'm not, nobody. I don't think in the audience is an HVAC expert or an industrial hygienist. If you are, I apologize. But those are the numbers you need to ask from your building maintenance people. What is the air exchange rate? What is the outdoor air intake? If you have those as, as a lay people, those are the numbers you need to know to, to have self, some degree of confidence that you've got a responsible and an effective indoor air quality. Now I must uh, I, let me add one more thing to that. We're going to get to the Q and A very quickly. Uh, bottom line is that uh, Gabor provided us with a lot of very technical detail. This is very detailed, and as as Gabor explained, um, there are certain key issues that one must ask in order to know whether you're in a safe zone, or shall I say, a safer zone. As Gabor mentioned, the issue of how many air exchanges per hour, that just makes common sense. How often is the air envelope in your room that you're in replaced with outside air? Number two, um, how, we're filtered. We're filtered. Right, and how good is the filter system that you have? Is the filter system taking out enough of the pathogens? All right, and then the question is how much outside air is coming in? Now, there are technological methodologies such as this CO2 detector. We have detectors that measure the, uh, the particulate rate in the room, the, the size of the particulates in the room, many different detectors. But I don't want to leave anyone with the idea that anybody can guarantee the air safety of a room. The bottom line is that after the experts come in and determine what's best for your specific facility, Every facility is different. The
the key, the mission, the target is to do what's necessary using the best available technology in order to minimize the risk to the extent possible and to a point where it's commercially feasible to do it in order to limit the transmission of the pathogen through what we're now referred to and you've been educated on the primary methodology of COVID risk transfer, which is through the little floating guys in the air. I'll now uh, turn it back to Samantha, who will be moderating the question and answers. Gabor, are you able to hear me? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So before we wrap it up, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say anything to the audience that they should keep top of mind before we wrap it up today. I think it, the key numbers are those last two slides, especially the last one with the graphs, as I said about the air exchange, and the outdoor air intake and filtration. If you can get those numbers from whoever's doing the air quality issues, then you will have all the numbers you need to do. You might have to be experts yourself by any stretch of the imagination. I hope I got across current thinking, historical, as well as current on airborne transmission of pathogens and the fact that we need to mitigate that. But I, the analogy I like to use is we treat our drinking water and now it's time to treat the air. Purif purifying one, Thank you. Excellent. Well, be, on behalf of Safeopedia, I want to thank Larry and Gabor for being here today and giving us a wonderful presentation with lots of information. As I mentioned, we will be reaching out after the presentation to connect with you on all those questions that you have. Um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for participating today. Thanks again. We will be sending out a copy of the recording as well as the slide deck to everyone in a few days. So thank you everybody for attending today. Thank you all of the dedicated safety professionals for the great work you're doing on a daily basis. Take care, stay safe. Bye everyone. Bye.